have-nots, a growing gap between the have-nots. They do not have the same rights, and eventually another civilization takes them over. Very early, 600s, what civilization was it? This is a callback from section two of chapter 10. So if you remember this, it might be a little different. What'd you say? Exactly, Ethan. Well done. The Umayyad dynasty falls to the Abbasids. No, he's, uh, were you kidding? No, that's it. That's what I'm talking about here. The Umayyad dynasty. No. You're thinking of the Mayan, the Mayans. No, he said Umayyad. But yeah, yeah. So they are that, they're who I'm talking about here. We see the same thing happen. They fall the opposites because they don't have social ability, because they have discrimination against haves and have nots. Mm. So going off of that, what do you think is going to happen to the Scylla? If the Umayyads fell because they had discrimination and now the Scylla are doing the same thing. They're going to fall too. Because of this, conflicts are going to grow between peasants and aristocrats. And this is single-handedly going to lead to the overthrow of the Scylla. Revolts happen and boom, the Scylla is done for. Okay? The next dynasty we're going to talk about is the Koryo dynasty. So this is where we're going to get modern Korea from. This is the dynasty that has the most influence on modern Korea. Um, it's going to replace the Scylla in 935. They're going to establish a capital um, in Songak. That is modern day Kaesong. They're going to have both Confucianism and Buddhism. They're going to be extremely influ influential, just like they were in the Tang and Song. And Koreans are going to take some inventions from China and start implementing them into their own culture. The first thing they're going to do is use a woodblock printing to produce Buddhist texts. Later, though, the Koreans are going to say, we have a better way to do this. And they start influencing and using um, a mobile metal type to print numbers in books. So they create their own that's more mobile and it's made of metal. They also learn to make porcelain from China, but then make it better. So that's where we get um, this green celadon. Unfortunately, though, if you guys have seen this before, it's not true celadon because... When the Mongols take over in 1200, they destroy a lot of industry, and one of those industries is the Celadon, and it's lost forever. So they have been unable to figure out how the Koreans made this at the time. Those two pictures are um, examples of it. That one is a carved flower. The other one is a vase. And you can see it's, it's very green, very pretty pieces of art. I don't know. The Mongols ruined that for us. It's a great question though. It's Celadon. It's like a porcelain. So it's a better version of porcelain. I don't know. If you guys ever get a time machine, go back and write it down. Come back and you'll be billionaires. <laughs> um, maybe we'll make that an extra credit assignment one day. So they are going to make this gorgeous porcelain. And like I said, when the Mongols take over, we're going to lose it forever, unfortunately. A little bit of foreshadowing there. The Mongols do take over in 13, or 1213, and they're going to occupy until 1350. We just talked about them. Um, they are kind of an unstoppable force at the time, but they do end up getting a hold on Korea. When they stop occupation in 1350, the Koryo returns very briefly until the Yi Song Gai overthrows them and sets up the Yi or the Chosin dynasty. This is the last and the longest lived dynasty. It's going to be under General Yi. He is going to do a lot to reduce Buddhist influence. So all the influence that we see in the Koryo and the previous dynasties that's reduced. And he's going to set up a government based on Confucian ideology. So this is very similar to how the government was ran in the Ming after the Mongols left. So again, very 
very close in time period. They're almost the same. A couple hundred years, I think, uh, different time span. But we see that same parallel of the Confucian dynasties mirroring in Korea and China. Like I said, during these Confucian ideologies, they in, had that influence that people are good, teachable, improvable, they're perfectible. Because of this, we have the civil service exams again in Korea being instituted. To this day, Korea still has the civil service exams. Um, so one of my teachers in college, he lived in Korea for three years, and the host family that he stayed with, his host brother took the exams, and he said that it was crazy intense. He would go to his school, he'd come home, he'd study till one or two in the morning, he'd go back to school, he'd come home, he'd study until one or two in the morning. So it was very, very intense. And then after the exams were over, he said he slept for like two weeks straight, just would get up, eat, go back to sleep, get up, eat, go back to sleep, very intense. Um, I had a question for you guys from the exams to answer. But all of the answers, the question was in English, all the answers were in Korean. So I can't read Korean, guys. I could nice. pretend I knew it, but I couldn't get to the answer. I didn't want to do that to you. Um, so they are very difficult to this day. They're still there. Again, Confucianism is going to become the key to moving up in education and society. Very important. Another thing that's going to happen during the Chosun is the Korean alphabet is going to come about. It's called Hangul. In 1443, King Sejong is going to create it. He is going to dislike the difficulty and the confusion of China's complex writing system. He's going to create Hangul. He's going to get a team to create it. It's going to end up becoming the language of the land. Initially, Confucian scholars in the upper class, Koreans reject it mainly because Confucianism and all those Confucian texts are going to be in Chinese. They're going to be in the language that China used. So it's going to be difficult to have that translation system. But eventually, because Hangul is so easy to learn and because it increased the literacy rate, those are two big things that I'm going to ask you guys about for sure on the test. Hangul both was easy to learn and also increased the literacy rate that allowed it to spread. It becomes the language. It's very important. Okay. Those are two very important things that I want you guys to think about when it comes to um, languages are in tiers. So you have, if you're a native English learner, there are different tiers for you to learn language. So for example, Spanish would be a tier two, German's a tier three, Arabic, uh, Mandarin, those are all going to be tier four. So it's not, there's not one specific that's the hardest to speak. They go in tiers, especially, and they also defer to what your native language is. Don't mean to get off track, but there's a little tidbit of information for you guys. If you are looking into learning a language, discover what tier the language is for your native language before you decide to jump into it. Anyway. Eventually, though, Japan's going to get a little big for his britches and invade Korea. We're going to spend most of our time, I think all of our time tomorrow, watching a video about this guy, Ad Admiral Yi Sun Shin. Um, there is a typo there in the PowerPoint. I just realized that. Oh but I know. This is a JV operation. Okay, guys. Um, in 1590s, the Japanese are going to use Korea to get to China. They're going to use it as a gateway. They're going to invade Korea in order to get a leg up on China. Um, for years, the Chinese soldiers are then just going to loot and burn their way around the peninsula, just for funsies. So Admiral Yi Sun Shin, he's got a very interesting story to how he became the admiral. But he is going to implement and use turtle ships, which are those ships you see on the picture there. Um, the top one is a diagram of one. The bottom one is an actual turtle ship. He is going to use these to combat the Japanese. And eventually, after six years, the Japanese are going to withdraw from Korea. However, when they leave, they're going to kidnap a bunch of artisans, a bunch of scholars, a bunch of academics, all these people, and take them back to Japan with them. Because why not? So, 
the last post I want you guys to comment today is the answer to this question. And it's not really a yes, no. It's more of a what do you think, okay? So we saw how much uh, China influenced Korea. How do you think Japan kidnapping these artisans, kidnapping these people, and bringing them to Japan is going to influence how Japan moves, how their culture, how their education, how their government runs? Pick one of those three, culture, education, government, and tell me how you think Korea is going to influence Japan, okay? That's what I want you guys to do for the rest of the period. Again, tomorrow we are going to watch a video on Admiral Yi Sun Chin. Um, and also, all outstanding assignments, I want them by tomorrow. Tonight, your extra credit is due, 11.59, okay? I'll give you guys the rest of the period to work on that. You have like six minutes. And then I will dismiss you guys at the end. Does anybody have any questions?